Well, we are in lesson six of our series that we have entitled Radical. God is calling us to live by a different standard. God is calling us to live as chosen people, as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation. None of that sounds like what we see happening in the world right now. God called us to be different, and it's in our being different from the world that we appear radical. Amen. Amen. And it's okay to not fit in. May I, I need to say that again. It is okay to not fit in because we are playing by a different rule book, and that's called the Bible. So throughout the series, we've learned how to live uh, radically in the way we, we have radical hope and love and peace and our families and by faith. And today I want to challenge you with this topic, radical church. Amen. A radical church. And let me give you this definition so that we are clear as to what the church is. The church is the kingdom of God's embassy on the earth to prepare ambassadors to transform the world. Jesus did not come to form a country club. I need us to hear this. Jesus did not come to put us on a cruise ship. Jesus called us to be in battle. He called us to be the church that is advancing God's agenda and not to just be on cruise control until we get to heaven. We don't like what we're seeing in the culture. The first place God looks is the church because it is his vehicle to change the world. And as a whole, we've not been doing a good job. Amen. Because the way things are looking, it's getting darker and darker. But I'm not discouraged because the darker things get, the more noticeable the light is. We have to get to the point that we are shining our light. We can't be an undercover church anymore. You can't be an undercover Christian on your job anymore. You can't be an undercover Christian on your neighborhood, in your neighborhood anymore because somebody has to speak up for Jesus. And so we've got to get out of this country club, this cruise ship mentality and recognize that we're in war. And it's not like it's a new thing. It's not that we are um, just realizing this from the beginning. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it's not on your note sheet and it's not on the screen, so you got to listen to me. All right? Praise the Lord. Um, it says, and from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and violent people are attacking it. So this is nothing new, because we are literally taking the fight to the gates of hell. Come on, that's what Jesus said. Upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So from the beginning, there's been an adversarial relationship between what the church is called to do and what the world is doing. So we should not be surprised that we have to fight in order to advance what God wants to do. The only question is, is the church full of fighters or is the church full of afraid people? Is the church full of people who will stand up and take the fight to the devil, or will the church cower in the corner, hoping that the devil passes us by? That's not who Hope Cathedral was ever called to be, nor will it ever be like that. Because this world is not going to be left in its condition, and we do nothing. We're going to fulfill our mission and do so with love. I'm not telling you go out there and fight and yell and scream and, 
and, and all that, call people names and judge people. That's not what I'm telling you to do. And that's not what Jesus t- called us to do. He called us to preach this gospel. He called us to represent what this gospel is all about. And so I want us to be reminded of who God has called us to be because we are founded by Jesus and we have a job to complete. So when Jesus brought his disciples close to him, he wanted to do a kind of an evaluation of what people were saying about him. So he brought his disciples and said, well, who do people say that I, the son of man, am? So he kind of gave them a hint at what the answer was. And they said, oh, well, you know, Elijah and one of the prophets and all that. And then Jesus switched the, uh, the, the conversation and said, but who do you say that I am? Because ultimately, this is not a hearsay gospel. You can't know Jesus because somebody else knows him. You got to know him for yourself. So Jesus wanted to know, who do you think that I am? And Peter stood up, Simon Peter stood up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus affirmed him and said, Peter, you know, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. Human reasoning did not give that to you. And it is upon that rock, that revelation, that Jesus is the Savior, the Son of God. He's the Messiah, the Son of God. It's that revelation that he'll build his church upon. That there's nobody like Jesus. That the one who has all the answers to all your problems is Jesus. That's what the church was founded upon. And now today... We have, uh, we've outsourced our purpose to everything else. We've outsourced our healing purpose to hospitals. We've outsourced our emotional wellness to therapists. And I'm not against any of that. But there was a time when we didn't have therapists, and we had to make it. Amen. Amen. And during all these times in history, when we didn't have all of these professions, we always had Jesus. My grandparents had an had a elementary school education, and when they had problems, they couldn't go to the bank to get a loan. They had to trust that God was going to make a way, and he always did. When they were sick and they did not have access to health care, they had to call on Jesus, and he always came through. And we have started to rely on human institutions and not rely on God. I'm not saying you shouldn't have insurance and all that kind of stuff. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is those are supplemental to the church, to Jesus. But if I can't get a doctor's appointment for a month, two months, I need some help before then. And I need to know that Jesus is there to help me. So Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so today I want to just kind of prod us and shake us a little bit because we've become too comfortable. And so I want to make the comfortable uncomfortable. And I want to afflict those who are in the status quo. I want you to realize I can't keep going like this and please God. You can still be a good church member, but you won't please God. And in this church, we want you to please God more so than we want you to be a good church member. Because if you are pleasing God, you'll be a good church member. Amen. Amen. So what do we do? What do we do so we can remain a radical church? Point number one is we have to settle who and what we believe. Who and what we believe. Do you really believe that Jesus is the answer? Not philosophically, but really believe down to your toes that if it's not for Jesus... You wouldn't be here. Yeah, I'm I'm saying we got to be real about this. Because if you think Jesus is just a good teacher, he's just a good guy, he's the man upstairs, then that's not sufficient enough for you to dedicate your whole life. God is calling us to settle. I know who Jesus is. Jesus is the best thing that has ever happened to me. I would not be alive. I would not be standing here were it not for him. And so since he gave it all for me, then I will give it all for him. But it's not just who he is, but it's also what he does. Because Jesus is the Savior. 
There is no other Savior. You can't find salvation in a bottle, in a pill, in a person, in power, in money. None of that will satisfy. All of us have a God-sized hole in our lives, and we try to fill it with any and everything that we can, and none of it satisfies. Only Jesus can fill that void. And so I can search all over, but I cannot find anybody who can fill that gap in my life. And I know we've tried, and we know that can't nobody do me like Jesus. So I went, went very colloquial, but I, I need you to get this. We've lost something in the songs we sing, in the, in the way we go about church in these modern days. We've lost what it means to really stand on his word and, and stick with Jesus. And so we just kind of treat Jesus like he's a, he's a best friend. He even got a worship song out there that, that calls Jesus their boyfriend. We've, we've, uh, we've gone into Lululand. And we treat Jesus like that. Because he's your boyfriend, you can break up with him. But when he's your Lord, you're with him from beginning to end. And that's something we cannot ignore. Here's what Paul says to to Timothy, his, that was his spiritual son that he was trying to train to be a pastor. Paul says, this is the message that I've been set apart to proclaim as a preacher, emissary, and teacher. It's also the cause of all this trouble I'm in. So the Bible's always been clear to us that when you stick with the gospel, you will have challenges. You will have resistance. You will have enemies. The only question we have to settle is, who do we want to have as enemies? Do you want to make the world mad and be, God, and be a friend of God? Or do you want to make God mad and be a friend of the world? Let me answer the question for you from Scripture. Friendship with the world is enmity with God, a state of being an enemy against God. We can't, we can't just stay in the middle. I don't want them to be mad at me, so I'm just going to be quiet while they tell little Jesus jokes and make fun of the church and everything else. Come on. When will you stand up? We, we have sat down for so long that they now feel comfortable disrespecting the church, disrespecting the one you say is your Savior and Lord. And you even sometimes laugh and giggle just that you don't stand out. Well, the devil is a liar. I will not allow the savior of my life, the one for whom I have been redeemed, I'm not going to let his name be mocked and ridiculed and laugh along with it so you'll like me. For God I'll live and for God I'll die. See, we've got to get back to that. See, we've gotten so, I just want a new car, I want to do this, I want to do that. No, 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 you missed it. You got to get all of Jesus first. So you want, you want the stuff before you get Jesus. That's not how it works. You're, you're feeding that, that, that secular mindset of greed. I want all of Jesus. And because he said it, he'll provide everything else that I need. But it's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing things, then all these things. Will be added unto me, but see, because we are we're more secular than we are sacred, we want all the things, and then we'll tolerate Jesus on Christmas and Mother's Day and Easter. Amen. Come on, if we want all of it, I want all that He has to give me. I don't just want the cross, but I want the empty tomb. I just don't want the empty tomb. I want the kingdom of God. I want everything He died to give me, and I am willing to take Him first. Because if I take him, then everything else comes along with it. So Paul said, I'm in trouble right now for no other reason other than I'm preaching the gospel. But I have no regrets. <laughs> my God, today I have no regrets. I couldn't be more sure of my ground. The one I've trusted in can take care of what he's trusted me to do right to the end. I can put my trust in him because he'll never fail me. So I can put my trust in him because he will never abandon me. 
he will be with me till the end. And Paul preached this gospel his entire life. And so Hebrews eleven six 6 reminds us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, church, are we really diligently seeking him? And I'm talking all of him, not just his hands. See, we're good at, 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 at going after people's hands. Kids, when they want something, they can be the nicest to their parents. When they want something, when they, when they come and say, oh, dad, you, you know, you're the best daddy we've ever had. Oh, dad, dad, dad. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. What you want? What you want? See? They're seeking my hands. Oh, oh, what a precious thing it is when they come and just say, you know, I really love you. And then they walk away. Don't want a thing. Just want to let you know who you are to them. How often do we pray and all we pray about is what I need? Give me, give me, give me. God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need the other. And then get mad at God when he doesn't deliver it in 90 seconds. When was the last time he just went into his presence and just said, God, I just want to thank you for who you are. Not asking you for a thing. Just want to let you know who you are to me. See, that's where we have to get to. But that's diligently seeking. Coming to church is not diligently seeking. That's just showing up. Amen. But you can come to church and still miss out on what God sent you here for. You see, and that, and that really is what happens. Because I come to church as a part of my diligently seeking him. I want to find him. I'm, it's great to see you all and love to be able to have fellowship with you, hang out with you, love on you. But I want to see him. I want to experience him in the midst of this spiritual family. And if I come here and just see you, as grateful as I am to see you, I've missed the main thing. Because I need Jesus. And I need to get as much as I can of him in this setting. So I must diligently seek him. I must diligently pray, diligently read the Bible, diligently uh, study the word of God. Why? Because that is the only pathway through which I can really get to know him and truly live devoted to him. But in addition to just what I know, I also have to boldly share the gospel. Boldly. And let me ask you this as a way to really convict you. Who is going to be in heaven because of you? Who's going to be in heaven because of you? You're in church and going to heaven because of somebody. So why would you rob someone of an experience in knowing Jesus just like you got? Because if God hadn't used people to bring you, you wouldn't be here. It may have been a mother, father, uncle, brother, who, a co-worker, friend. Someone always is used in the process to bring others to Christ. And there are people who have been assigned to you. How much of a shame it would be to literally go and stand before Jesus and say, hey, and Jesus says, well, how come you didn't share your faith with all these people? And I, well, you know, Lord, I was busy. Um, I, I, I was running and ripping and trying to make things happen, trying to provide for my family and go all, all the excuses that we come up with, none of them will satisfy. Because we're talking about eternities on the line. It's not just about who, where you're going to eat dinner. It's about where you're going to spend eternity. Can you imagine, and now everything is caught on camera, that you were standing there and you saw a person about to walk into oncoming traffic and a truck was coming and was going to take their life and you just looked? Can you imagine the scorn and derision that would be uh, directed at you because you let that person walk out there to their death? And you did nothing to stop it. That's what we're doing spiritually to people when we don't share the good news of the gospel with them. 
you've got good news. Rather than confirming all the bad news that's around, why wouldn't we preach, declare, share the good news that we have? Oh, sure is bad out here. Yeah, isn't it? It's real bad, isn't it? No, that's a time for you to share the good news. Hey, it may be bad, but I know somebody who can turn it to good. See? Oh, things are going down. Not if you're with Jesus. Everything around you may go down, but he's going to still take you up. You got to have a boldness about this thing. But you can only have boldness when you have settled who Jesus is. If you haven't settled who Jesus is, then you'll go with any wind and doctrine. You'll go with any opinion because you just want to fit in. A silent church is a deadly church because nobody's going to get the good news and lives are going to be lost and spend eternity separated from God. And none of us wants to be a part of that. So we've got to boldly declare the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 28, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching those new disciples to obey all the commands. See, we got to teach them to obey. We don't like that word obey because it's a, it's a cuss word to Christians. Obey, nobody tells me what to do. I'm seven times three. I can do what I want to do. Not if you're a Christian. Our unwillingness to obey God calls into question if we really know God. Because as Quinn said earlier, how can you say you love God who saved your life, who gave his son for you, but yet you won't obey him? That means you don't value what was done. So in her example earlier, if, if that person who lifts the, the van off of uh, the other driver who was hurt, that person would, would be so grateful to have life that you wouldn't have to force them to be kind to the person who saved their lives. It would come naturally. But yet we got to, it's like pulling teeth. We got to obey God. Got to obey God. That shouldn't be the case. If you really have been saved by grace through faith, it should be an easy thing. God, you want me to tithe? Okay, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but, I, but my answer is yes. God, you want me to love people, even my enemies? I think it's going to be rough, but yes. You want me to fast for 21 days during the, the prayer and fasting season? Oh, my. But yes, our answer to God should be yes. We're so disconnected from God and so uh, dismissal of his, 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 his divinity and his power and his majesty that we literally can look at God and tell him no. I'm not saying to a preacher or to some other Christian, but to God, we look, up, we look at him and say no thanks. How can we do that to our Savior? How can we do that? It's because we do not and have not settled who he is to us. Amen. And because we've not settled it, the world is settling it for us. And we are one foot in, in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. Well, may I disabuse you of that, of that notion? Because if you have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom, in actuality, you have both feet in the world. And you are in that category that now is an enemy of God. And we, we've, we've, we've neglected this sense that the Bible does say that we are to have a fear of God. I need you to hear me. Not that we're afraid of him and we tremble and all of that, but we have such a healthy respect for him that we would never want to disappoint him. The same reverence and, and, and respect and even fear that we have of our parents, should have of our parents. Because when I was raised, I loved, loved my grandparents and everything else. But I also didn't want to cr cross them because I knew if I crossed them. Didn't I tell you? And I didn't want that. 
And we've got to realize this is not a joke here. This is not a game. There is a judgment that's coming for each and every one of us. And, 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 and we, we are faithful to God knowing that we are going to have to give an account of every deed done in our body and every word that we've spoken. We have to give an account. And I don't want to go before him and get judged by him because I did not have a real relationship with him. And point number three, and we're done. I can never be ashamed. If we're going to be radical, we can't be ashamed of our God. Don't be ashamed that you serve a God who sent his only son to die on the cross. Don't you be ashamed that the central point of, of your faith is an empty tomb. Don't you be ashamed that he was abused and beaten and mocked all for your sake. Don't be ashamed that when the Bible says, love ye one another, that's exactly what it means. Well, that makes me look weak. No, it makes you look strong. Because the world does the weak thing by resorting to violence where we resort to love. Because our Savior went to the cross in love. Though they nailed him to the cross, that's not what kept him on the cross because he could have called 10,000 angels to come and rescue him, but he stayed on that cross because of love. Because without that cross, you and I would all be lost. But it's because of the cross that I now have a right to live on earth and live eternally with him in heaven. So I can't be ashamed because if I'm ashamed of him down here, he'll be ashamed of me. Come on. I want God to show, to see that the life of his son was not wasted. We want the world to act right, and we don't act right. But the world doesn't say it's following Jesus. But we do. So I can stand unashamedly because I'm doing my best to obey him. And that has to be all of our stories. Will you get it right 100% of the time? No because you and I are human. But I at least want to err on the side of doing what he wants me to do. Amen. As opposed to being comfortable, well, he knows my heart. Now that ought to strike fear in you. Because he does know your heart. And you may have been able to cover it up and, and talk, it, you know, talk your way out of stuff. That's not going to happen with God. You know God has said, get your finances under the kingdom of God. That's what the tithe does. The tithe gets our finances under the kingdom of God. And we've said, I ain't doing that. I can't afford the tithe. What? Who gave you what you have? You can't, you, you can't afford it? Let me, see, let me see what you're spending on. You can't afford it because he's not a priority to you. Amen. And the tithe is so sacred, you don't pay the tithe last. You don't write out everything else and then say, okay, what's left over? Okay, God, I'm going to give you that. No, that's not tithing. Tithing is giving him the first 10%. So when, 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 my, when my check hits the bank, in fact, this, this, uh, this last time I got paid, the money hit the bank, and I was about to transfer money and do all that kind of stuff, and right when I was ready to hit send, Holy Spirit convicted me. So you're going to put me last? I was like, ooh, and I don't do that. I mean, I, my first thing is go to Zell, send my tithes and offering in. And I was about to mess up because I knew a check was coming and I knew I needed to move money so it could be covered. So, I would, so that was all that was on my mind until the Holy Spirit checked me. And I stopped it, went back out, went to my Zell, sent my tithes and offering in first because I like to see the deposit made and the first withdrawal is going to God. So that, so that I know who's first place in my life. See, we, we make excuses, but one day we'll have to stand before him 
And God's going to say, how come you didn't share your faith with that? How come your cousin's in hell right now because you wouldn't humble yourself to let them know the way they were going was not going to lead to success? Why didn't you at least invite them to church? We, see, we, 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 we are so self-centered that all we can think about is us. And we're glad we're going to heaven, but we're okay with somebody else not. That's not the heart of God. If, that, if that's the heart of God, then you wouldn't be here. And if God can save you, why can't he save somebody else? All he wants us to do is cooperate with him. All he wants us to do is cooperate. And so Paul said this, and I'm done. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. For it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. The Jews first and also to those Gentiles. I'm not going to be ashamed of this gospel because it's the only thing that's real. Hear me. It's the only thing that's real. We get wrapped up in all this stuff going on and politics and all this other kind of stuff. Listen, politics comes and goes. But the gospel is here forever. And it has the power to save lives. It has the power to transform an addict into a preacher. The gospel has the power to take what we used to call a whoremonger and turn him into a faithfully married man. The gospel has the power to transform the weak-minded who can't stand or make a decision about anything and cause them to stand strong and say, I'm going to do this for God. The gospel has the power to take any life that's broken, messed up, fallen down, transform them, pick them up, dust them off, and give them a purpose and a mission that they'll be about until they meet Jesus. There is power in this gospel. And you can't find that power anyplace else. Only in the word of God. We need to be a radical church. Father, we repent for any time we've not been serious about you, any time we've not willfully and willingly obeyed those times, Father, that we've walked away from you knowing that you wanted something better for us. And so, Father, we ask you to forgive us. And we repent, which means we change our mind about our old way of living so we can live for you in Jesus' name. And while your heads are still bowed and your eyes are still closed, I really want you to do some self-examination. That's why I ask you to bow your head. I'm not trying to exercise control over you or anything like that. I want you to not be distracted because this is the most important question that you'll ever answer. Where do I stand with God? Not where does your mama, your daddy, your cousins, your husband, your wife, no, where do you stand with God? God wants to have a real relationship with you. In fact, he's knocking at the door of your heart right now. The only question is, will you answer? You're going to be one of them. You, you know, you're, saying, you're saying to yourself right now, I don't want to be one of them. One of what? The blessed? The free? The transformed? Because I know you think being a Christian is weird. No, it's not. It's unusual to this time but yet it is, it is a sign, an example of who Jesus is because Jesus was seen as weird during his time, but yet his life transformed all of history. God wants to do the same thing in principle with your life. He wants your life to matter. He wants to bring out the purpose and destiny that he put you on, on this earth for. And all he needs is your yes. And so if you're here today and you don't know where you stand with God, but you want to know, I want to pray for you. All I'm going to ask you to do so I know who I'm praying for is just raise your hand as a, as a signal to me. Please, I want to be included in that prayer because I want to know where I stand with God. Praise God for that hand. Other others would say, I want to be sure where I stand with God. Praise God. You online, hit that hand raise button, and that lets me know to include you in this prayer. Now, I want you to use my words 
but use your own faith. Pray this prayer with me. Say, my Father, I know without Jesus I'm lost. I believe Jesus is alive. So I make him the leader of my life. Father, fill me with your spirit and show me your plan for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God thanks for that?